Um, we are going to get started right away. Sorry, I had a little bit of a technical issue. But today we're talking about intestinal flukes. And the purpose for this video is really to help you to see that flukes are much more common than we realize. And that it's really nice to know what they look like, the symptoms they cause, how we treat them successfully, because they are a really big part of chronic disease. And I really believe that they're more common than we realize. So if we haven't met, my name is Pam Bartha. I am the author of Become a Wellness Champion and the founder of Live Disease Free. And you might wonder how in the world I ever ended up doing this type of work while well, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis over 30 years ago. And I, I, w I thought I was a really healthy person. And I went from being a super healthy person to being diagnosed with an incurable, disabling, demyelinating disease. And I was told by the experts that there was nothing that I could do. Long story short, I've been able to live MS-free for now 35 years, and I have not only recovered, but I've helped hundreds of people all over the world recovering from all kinds of chronic diseases by treating the cause, which is different types of parasites that are present in our body. And so what I'd like you to do is join in and type in your questions in the question box and say hello, and we're going to get started right away. But the topic today is something that a lot of people don't know much about. Like when I went to university, we learned about all kinds of, I did a biology degree and a math degree, and we learned about different types of parasites, but we didn't talk a lot about flukes. And they cause so much inflammation in the body. They are a really big part of sometimes of our symptoms. And there's ways that we can figure out if we have them or not. And there's a lot of different flukes, unfortunately. So today we're going to just talk about intestinal flukes. So make sure to type your questions in the question box. And we are, I'm just going to start to share some of the, the notes that I wanted to share first of all. So intestinal flukes and just flukes in general, they are part of a group of flatworms called trematodes. And they, in many of them, do infect humans. And there are thousands of different types of flukes. They're a flatworm and about, I would say, 70 that they know of, different types would live in the human digestive tract. So 70 is still quite significant. There could be more, but this is what we know. And it's estimated that at least 40 to 50 million people around the world are infected with flukes. I just want to make sure you guys can hear me. I'll just check. Yeah, everything looks good. <laughs> awesome. So they're a lot more common than we realize. And there are sometimes there's parasites that are neglected. And I personally feel that flukes are quite neglected because when I was doing research for this, it was like, it's in Asia it, and, and the life cycles are, you know, I'm sure that, that what they have in the literature is part of their life cycle. But like, I personally have not been eating any aquatic like plants and I haven't been to Asia. So I think that flukes are a lot more common than we realize and that it's easier to pick up fluke infections than we realize. And we do have international worlds. Like a lot of people are moving to different countries and we could be introducing different parasites. We're eating produce from all over the world. So, and we're eating fish and, and sometimes the fish is migrating. So we do have reason to be exposed to different types of flukes and this is a really important topic. The reason I know so much about it is because intestinal flukes were one of the parasites that I believe were causing a lot of my symptoms, a lot of gut issues. And, and luckily, I was able to get the MS under control years ago, but I was never able to treat parasites because in Canada... <laughs> We don't treat, we don't have parasites in Canada. So our doctors do not treat parasites in Canada. But by the grace of God, I learned and, uh, and I'll explain that all to you how I came to this. But I really hope that this helps you if, if you have all, if you know that you're dealing with parasites and this is one parasite that you can 
rule out or maybe you're dealing with a type of fluke. I think it's a lot more common than we realize. So flukes are flatworms, just like tapeworms. So they're part of the same group. But tapeworms would be long. They can be many, many feet long. And they're kind of like a ribbon. Whereas the flukes are more oval and they're shorter and they're wider. So they're maybe, let's, they're different sizes. So I don't want to say that, you know, they're all this size, but the larger intestinal flukes, they can be, let's say, at least a centimeter wide. And then they could be anywhere up to seven or seven and a half to eight, like at least seven and a half centimeters long. So they're quite big. Not all of them are going to be that big that we pass. Usually when I pass them, they were about three inches usually. And, and I'm going to share with you like what, how we have, um, basically how we've gotten rid of the flukes, but they're rubbery. So like when, when people are looking at parasite pictures that they, the things that they've passed or parasites they've passed, I've looked at hundreds and hundreds of pictures and it's true that you know, sometimes people think they're passing worms, but it's just di partially digested food. Sometimes there is biofilm. Sometimes there is mucus. Sometimes there is this is called catar. It's kind of like baked on fecal matter that could be on our intestines. But these intestinal flukes are very characteristic for several reasons. It's it's what they look like, but also when we're passing them, like what parasite drugs we're taking when we pass them. So again, they're rubbery. So they're not just like loose mucus that falls apart. You have to like, if you had a plastic fork, you'd have to kind of like push down to try to cut through it. And rubbery, translucent, um, kind of like a creamy brown color. And when like when we're working through the live disease free plan, we're getting ready to treat. Then we're looking to see which parasite treatments we test well for. And then when we're treating, we're doing enemas with an oxidizing agent. And so when we do the enema, just so you know, cause I'm gonna show you some pictures that let's say you do an enema one morning and then you do another enema the next morning the the parasite has died in your body like after the first enema because it's it was hit with some oxygen but the body starts to break it down so it's not going to be the perfect shape so i'm going to share with you um one student shared a perfect shape of one that i believe is a is is one of these flatworm these flukes these intestinal flukes because it's three inches so the other flukes are the other flukes that are intestinal flukes are quite small. So this would be like kind of, they're called the giant fluke, intestinal fluke. But you'll find that the other pictures I share with you, they're a little bit more digested. So they almost look like a blob, but you'll see the pictures. They're very characteristic. I've seen many times myself passing them and many of my students passing these pictures and sending me these pictures. And I guess the bottom line is that they're definitely a parasite. They're very characteristic all the time. And they're flat and they're wide and they're, they're so they're not like a roundworm. Roundworms would be several inches long. And these are a lot shorter and fatter and wider and translucent and rubbery. So how do we get infected with these intestinal flukes? It's really hard to find information about intestinal flukes. But basically, they talk a lot about, you know, it's more prevalent in Africa and in Asia. And like there's these snails that become infected and then um, fish can become infected and, and humans can become infected from eating aquatic plants that are infected with the larva. Remember I talked, if you've been watching my or following me, you know, I've talked a lot about the immature form of the tapeworm. Same group. But we're talking about flukes today, but how the immature form sometimes causes a lot of problems. So, but we're living in like North America and we are having these flukes here. So there's, I think there's really a lot of gaps in the information that we have available to us about, and even that practitioners would have available to them about intestinal flukes. But humans can become infected 
with these flukes, especially with the immature, the larva state, the cystic larva state, when we're drinking contaminated water, when we're eating different types of seafood, um, and also the meat, certain meat, so poultry and beef and sheep and pork, they can all become infected with different types of flukes, including intestinal flukes. So basically this larva, the immature form, so it's not the egg, it's the hatched larva, and it's the infective state. It is uh, makes its way like we ingested, and it makes its way down to the intestine, and it likes to live in the small intestine, and from there it will grow into a fluke, and it will attach to the intestine. And there are a lot of symptoms of, like flukes are nasty. They cause a lot of inflammation. They can cause abdominal pain and diarrhea or constipation. And it takes about one to two months before we're really infected after we've ingested the immature form. But we can have like kind of like an ulcer in our stomach, so ulceration, and then around the area where the muca where the, the fluke is living in our small intestine, there can be a lot of mucus produced in that area and of course inflammation. And we could have bowel obstruction eventually, but a lot of abdominal pain, nausea. We can have occasionally times where we're feeling nauseous. Like, you know, sometimes we might feel nauseous and we're not really sure why, and it'll kind of settle down. Weight loss, just feeling unwell also, fever, allergic reactions, swelling, especially edema in the ankles and feet and legs, but also in the face. And then other things could be hypoalbuminemia, <laughs> hypoalbuminemia, hi hypoalbuminemia. There we go. And protein. So it's basically low albumin. Okay, that's <laughs> that's an easier way to say it. All these words are such tongue twisters. And then. Uh, looking to see B12 for sure, B12 absorption. So we can have the B12 deficiency, malabsorption of other nutrients and eosinophilia. So we can have uh, a higher number of a certain type of white blood cell that goes after parasites, which are the eosinophils. Also, the diarrhea can alternate with the constipation. Hunger pains is another, one of the first symptoms of these flukes. There can be a little bit of bleeding at the site where the flukes attach. Um, it could have bloody diarrhea, but that's not necessarily a major symptom. But a lot of toxemia and allergic symptoms and a lot of inflammatory symptoms, um, spasticity, neurological symptoms like that, for sure. So they're, they're nasty. Uh, muscle twitching, the spasms, the muscle spasms, they can actually, for some of the species of the intestinal fluke, they can actually find their way into the spinal cord again. So this is another, we talked about in a previous video about the immature tapeworm larva cysts, which causes neurocysticercosis. But now we see that flukes, some of the species of flukes, their larva, their immature forms can make their way into the spinal cord and can manifest as motor and sensory deficits. So at, a le at the level of the lesion. So another, another parasite that can cause a lesion in your central nervous system. And I talked about how parasites cause lesions in the central nervous system last week. So how is this diagnosed? So this is tough. You can get a stool test done and they can look for the eggs and they could possibly look for the adult worms, but we've never had any success with our students finding these parasites in stool tests. I mean, there was one and actually <laughs> that was a really sick student. She sent her stool sample into a lab where there was a, a retired parasitologist, really great experienced parasitologist, had time to actually examine her stool, probably more than a lot of other labs would. And she said, nope, you've got no parasites. 
the day she got her test result back, she ended up was using, she was using an oxidizing agent. She did an enema and she passed this huge whipworm, which is in one of the pictures in my masterclass training. Make sure to watch that if you haven't watched that yet. And she sent it back to him and he goes, oh yeah, that is, and I think it was a whipworm. So the, t the tests are really pathetic. They're very, very poor. They're not picking up any of the larger parasites. And that's why I just say to my students, just save your money. They're really not, um, they're not helpful. They really are not helpful at this time. So other tests, there's iodine, there's formalin method, PCR. But again, it's really hard to get doctors to buy into this that you have flukes. They always want to know, like, have you traveled to another country? And if you haven't traveled to another country, then chances are they're not going to be, they'll do a stool test, nothing will show up, and that'll be the end of it. You could insist to see a, a gastroenterologist, probably would be better to see a parasitologist if you can, an infectious disease doctor, that would be better. But there again, you'd have to do a lot of convincing for them to believe because they're just not trained to believe that this is a problem for us. And it has been a huge problem for me. And my it's, it's quite common. I've seen in other students that have MS and other students that don't have MS, they're passing these very large parasites that are flat and they are not long and skinny like a roundworm or a tapeworm. There's nothing else that we can think that it could be except for a fluke. That's what flukes are, flat, shorter, flatter, and more oval type thing. So treatment. There, this is only for the intestinal flukes. The liver flukes definitely are going to be treated differently. So for the intestinal flukes, proziquantel seems to be the most helpful. Is it a magic cure? No. There are other parasite drugs that could be used in conjunction. I've seen research showing that pyrantal pomoate can be helpful. So it's kind of like making it more effective. It's kind of like adding another layer of poison. And then also alinea could possibly be helpful. So this again is where very often using a combination of the parasite drugs can be more helpful in treating the intestinal flukes. And that's what we're talking about today. I will talk about liver flukes at a different time, but intestinal flukes. And niclosamide could potentially also be helpful. So it has been reported in vitro to be helpful. So niclosamide is another parasite drug that treats uh, flatworms, like uh, tapeworms and flatworms. So if you test well, if you energy test well for proziquantel and niclosamide, then you may have some flatworms, either tapeworms or flukes. All right. So I should just mention to you, so then with respect to testing, we have found that just doing the energy testing is a lot more helpful. And energy testing is literally where you are taking one dose of a commonly prescribed parasite drug into the office of a practitioner. It could be a chiropractor that does applied kinesiology. It could be a naturopathic physician or a nurse practitioner. Sometimes doctors will do, integrative doctors will do energy testing. They're skilled at it. They might use a machine. They might use advanced muscle testing. But I wouldn't just use like a nutritionist or just somebody who, you know, they're wonderful. But I would use a healthcare professional that uses this in their practice a lot. They have a good reputation that like a lot of people are very happy with the results they're getting and they use energy testing daily in their practice. Energy testing is not an exact science, but it can be helpful. And if you do get energy testing done, make sure that the practitioner doesn't know what they're testing. You want them to be blind. You want to try to remove any biases that you can. So if they're just completely like unbiased and they're just like, yes, no, yes, this one tests well, no, not that one, yes, this one. That's what you want. You don't want them looking and going, oh, that sounds like like a, a serious drug and I wonder if that could hurt you and then all of a sudden, oh, you don't test well for it. Our mind is very powerful and it can totally play tricks with us. So this is where we want to try to avoid 
any bias. So the really good, the really good energy testing practitioners, they'll say, I don't even want to know what it is. I will just energy test. So this is one piece of the puzzle as to how we figure out which treatments are best for us. And we don't rely on that solely. So we look at our health history and the health history of our parents. We look at our symptoms. There are very specific symptoms for fungus, very specific ones for different types of worms, very specific ones for the Lyme infections and all of these different microbes. So that is a really big clue. We also consider our diagnoses, what we were diagnosed with. And then finally, we look at the energy test results. So we're not basing everything. And the energy test results should make sense. If it doesn't make sense with everything else of your health histories, your symptoms and all that, then we would discard it and we would use a different practitioner for sure. But it has been helpful. The energy testing has been helpful, much more helpful than stool testing for sure. And I'm hoping that as there is a growing interest in parasites, in the types of parasites that are making us sick, that we are going to have better tests. We are going to have more accurate. But if you even think about flukes, if there are thousands of different species of flukes, can you imagine like even the PCR, like even genetic testing, like it's going to take time for them to have all of the sequences of all of the different thousands of flukes, never mind thousands of bacteria and thousands of protists and thousands of worms, round worms and tapeworms and on and on. So that's our dilemma, right? Is that there could be different parasites that we haven't really identified in humans yet either because we're not looking in humans. It's, it's a, the whole study of parasitology has not been very popular in the last few years. And really, that is the biggest cause of why we're sick. And that has to change. So the, the parasites, the flukes, they will feed on cells, on cells in our body, cell fragments, but they'll also feed on the food in the intestine for sure. So what I wanted to do is go to some pictures uh, that I wanted to share with you, and hopefully this is going to work for me. Technology is great. So, okay, I'll go over here, and then that one. Hmm. Just one sec here. So I've got some really cool slides that I wanted to share with you, and, and I really hope that this works. Let's see. Okay, before I do that, I just want to check, is the sound good? It's not echoing or really soft. Just let me know if the sound is okay. Let's see here. Sound good? Let's just, it might take a second here for people to be able to. Um, is the sound all right? I don't see any problems with the sound. Okay, I'm just going to carry on. Good. Okay. All right, so these are just a few pictures that I've put together for you because pictures are like a thousand words. So this is just a sketch diagram of an intestinal fluke and you don't have to worry about the anatomy of the fluke, but I want you to pay attention to those two dark lines that are running down the fluke. And those are actually the intestines of the fluke. So with our students, very often they will see these two lines and and that helps to identify what it is because remember that with our students they are using the parasite drugs and they are also using an oxidizing agent which is killing the parasite like if the oxidizing agent with the enema uh, if the parasites in the large intestine and they're doing an enema that oxygen in the in the enema will kill the parasite and it's not leaving the body until the next day. So your body's going to start to break it down a little bit. But they still seem to see these two lines or veins or intestines, whatever you want to call them. And they do have suckers. You can see there's a sucker on the top. And then just a little ways down, there's also another sucker. And they use them to hold on. Here's another side view of the, the fluke, intestinal fluke. So you can see, again, those two intestine, that light yellow colored, yellowy brown color. So just kind of keep that in mind. 
So now these are two pictures of intestinal flukes that you can find online. And the one on the left, I don't know if that is like a, an, something that's made up with a computer or if it is for sure real. The one on the right probably are real, but it's hard to tell from things like that, but at least it hopefully gives you a little bit of an idea of what they look like. Again, they're rubbery, they're translucent, they are oval shaped, elongated. And so these now, this is actually, I won't, this is not an intestinal fluke, this is a liver, these are liver flukes. But I wanted to share with you just because I don't have a lot of pictures from online, but here this is a liver that's infected with flukes. But you can see again, they're flat, they're oval shaped, these would be smaller than a lot of the large intestinal flukes that, that we have seen that our students have passed, but you still get the idea of kind of what you're looking for. It's kind of like this. So this would be, uh, these are flukes that have not been damaged at all by an oxidizing agent or your body digesting. And these are healthy, full, intact liver flukes. And here again, these are more liver flukes. So again, you can see that they're a little bit oval shaped. They're gonna be smaller than the intestinal flukes, but again, they're kind of like, like rubbery, right? And oval shaped and creamy color, translucent. So that gives you an idea of what they look like. And you can almost see a little bit of the intestine in one of them, the two lines, or veins that could be veins too, I'm not sure. So this is actual, passed from one of our students. So our student did, um, she tested well for working with a practitioner. She was prescribed pyrantal palma weight, which is not the most, like the most useful parasite drug for intestinal flukes, but she followed the bottle dose or, or the package dose and where you have to do it by weight. And I think for her weight, she might've had to take six tablets at night. And the next morning she passed this. And again, you know, the consistency she said was like very rubbery, um, translucent. And you can almost see like one of the veins or the intestine down the middle of it. And so that would be an intact fluke. So literally it was killed overnight and it just happened to come out like wonderful because then it hasn't had been, because whenever something is in your body and if it dies like an, a parasite, your body's going to start to break it down it, and it wants to get rid of it, right? But this has been just a few hours it was in her. So it was quite intact. And again, holding it up against the fork um, about three inches long, she said. This is another intestinal fluke. So this is a little bit of a farther back picture. We will put them on our website so you can zoom in on them. But this was past, so this person, again, just was starting to do parasite treatment. He tested well for praziquantel and for parental palma weight and probably a few others. He started with the parental palma weight, parental palma weight, and so he took this he took the one dose, and, and normally our students will take it with their doctor. They'll be working with their doctor, and they'll, they'll be having a prescription for at least 10 to 14 days. But within, like, the first dose of taking this, and this gentleman is not really sick either, which is interesting. So his wife is really sick, and he's deworming with his wife. So he energy tested with the practitioner really well for praziquantel, parental palmoid, and others. And he, so he started with parental palm weight and then he did the oxidizing enemas for a couple of days and this came out and he said it was about three inches long and it was floating in the top of the water. So this is not mucus because like if you are treating, there are times when I've seen that our students are passing mucus and it falls apart or uh, muco uh mucus or biofilm is kind of fluffy, it falls apart. This is like, it holds together really well. Even if it's been dead in your body for 24 hours, it still holds together really well. Like you literally would have to cut it with your fork to break it apart. And then this is another student. So this one is about one, two, 
one, two, three, four, it's over three inches long. Um, and I'm going to show you what's nice is some of our students are like when they're, let's say they did, they're using the parasite drugs and this person was using praziquantel um, and she was using other parasite drugs. You can see she passed something like that was a little bit more like a roundworm, a little bit longer below that. But she did like a CD enema one morning or one night. I can't remember what she said. And then 24 hours later, she did another CD enema. So with the first water that comes out with the oxidizing agent, with the, the I should say, the oxidizing enema, when she did that, um, she used like a little container to catch the water or some people will use a colander and she was able to catch that. So I'm going to show you what it looks like in um, in a minute, like in like in water, so that you can see because it looks different now than it does in water. And right now it looks like a blob, but it's it really holds together very well. And but again, it's not the perfect oval shape right now because it was digested in the body for about 24 hours because of um, the difference in doing the enema. Here's another one again. So they're they're kind of translucent, kind of creamy color, rubbery, and a lot of times there is stool inside and that they're, I'm sure, using it for their food. So the next one I wanted to share with you is what it looks like when um, it came out of, the, out of her in some water. So she caught it, put it in some water, and you can see those two lines, and that's really characteristic. So like if you're passing something like this, and what happens is the flatworms, they will open up like the, as they are digested. And so then it looks almost like I call it like a stingray, it looks like. So that would be a fluke that has been fairly digested in 24 hours in the body, and it's opened up. But you can see those two lines there. So I hope that helps you to see. So if you're passing things like this when you're learning how to do the the, the um oxidizing enemas and there are different agents you can use for oxygen for doing the enemas that will treat the parasites i'm just gonna exit out of here because i think that's my last slide yes it is so i'll exit out so i'll just see if you guys have any questions also okay i have to get back here oh there we go there I'm back. <laughs> awesome. So I'm going to go to your questions. Uh, let's see here. Lots of questions here. So hello, Michael, and hello, David. The US FDA is blocking deliveries of, of different medications to countries. Yes, I know. Um, I That's really awful. It, they... So there's a big war going on right now. Um, especially, this has all happened since that lovely virus that happened just a little while ago. But um, we're still being able to treat. And the nice thing is that there are more doctors that are wanting to treat. So you just have to work with the right person, and you will get access to the treatments that you need. And it. It's just so night and day when you find the right treatments. Like our students are like, oh my gosh, I can exercise again. I have strength. I can skip up the stairs. I can fall asleep like a normal person and I can sleep through the night. Like these are all symptoms. It's like, even for myself, like, yes, I was able to totally manage the MS where I was MS free, but I still had the parasites. And being able to pass them, I just thank God, because you feel like a normal person. You feel like you're supposed to feel. You feel 20 years younger. You have stamina. You're like, oh, I can handle that. I can do that. Whereas when you have all these parasites and the flukes are really nasty. So like if you test really well for praziquantel or for niclosamide, really start to think about tapeworms and flukes because, you know, that is something that was not on my radar at all until, you know, I saw things coming out and I was like, what the heck is that? And when they're flat and they're not long, 
then they can only be flukes, right? Because there's roundworms and there's tapeworms and there's flukes. And those are really the three different types, the main groups of parasites. And so if they're not long and skinny, then they are flukes. And also, if you test well for the fluke medications, that's another confirmation. So they are, what I'm seeing in my students is that because, especially when we have a lot of inflammation, we have the, you know, the edema, we have the swelling, we have, we just are, have the toxemia, we have the terrible, lots and lots of pain and they're just, they're nasty. I would say that probably the flukes probably cause more symptoms than even the tapeworms and the roundworms. I, I believe that they really do. Oh, and then they also carry their own parasites. So I think it's Ehrlichia that one of the species of flukes will carry. So, and that's just like one that was found. And are they really even looking? So we know, again, and I always share this, that these larger parasites, they infect us with smaller parasites. And some of the smaller parasites can really make us sick also. Hello from Michigan. Good question, David. Um, What is the most cost-effective way to obtain these medications? So, David, I can't talk about that on this, this uh, video because I will totally be censored. And the thing is that when you want to treat, you have to work with someone. These are medications. You have to use them safely. You have to use them effectively if you mess around with them. If you take smaller doses, you might not hurt yourself, but you easily can make these parasites resistant to the treatments. And then you can never use them again. They're not going to work. They're no these parasites are notorious be for becoming resistant to treatment. So when you're working with someone, and that's what we can help you to do, we can help you to access the practitioners you need, the, the treatments you need, etc., in the plan. Or you can talk to your doctor. You can talk to nurse practitioners. You can talk to functional medicine doctors. You can talk to different doctors. It is harder to find them on your own for sure, but that is the expertise that that's what we do. That's our, what we eat, sleep, and breathe is helping people to do this. This is what we do. Another question here. You're very welcome. And uh, MS. So yes. So it's not just for multiple sclerosis. Um, I've, I've shared so many different, you know, just over the last few weeks, we know that the tapeworm larval cysts, when they get in the central nervous system, they can cause migraines, they can cause epilepsy, they cause, they're found in every MS patient that Dr. Alan McDonald looked at. So it's not just the flukes, it's the tapeworms, it's the roundworms. And when we have chronic disease, we really have to think that way. We have to think, okay, I'm not dealing with one parasite. I'm dealing with multiple parasites. And when you do that, you get the greatest recovery because otherwise you're just treating one group of parasites and you're like, oh, well, I feel a lot better. That's good enough. No, you could feel even better and better and better if you really knock back the fungus, knock back if you have Lyme infections, them, but also big worms, small worms, round worms, flat worms, protists, and bring back the good microbes. The more you get skilled, and this is a skill that you can develop. This is what we teach. My background is teaching, and this is the program I've developed as a live disease-free plan, which helps people to play an active role in their healthcare to recover from incurable diseases. And yes, I was diagnosed with MS 35 years ago. Hard to believe. Um, you're so very welcome, Sonia. And he hello, Jewel. You recently had a treatment for H. pylori. Um, should I be more or less worried about flukes? If you have H. pylori, it's usually because you are in an inflamed state. So your, your stomach acid is lower than normal. And so when you have chronic inflammation from other parasites in your gut and in the rest of your body, 
then you end up with lower stomach acid. And then with lower stomach acid, you start to get things like H. pylori growing in your stomach. And you can get heartburn and ulcers and you can get um, GERD eventually where we get inflammation in the esophagus. So yes, it's very important to go all the way down to treating the cause. And so with the, with the plan that we have, it's number one, stop feeding the infection so much. So following the live disease-free diet. Then the next step is to support the body so you're feeling a lot better. And sometimes, you know, with low stomach acid, it might, what the doctors usually want to do is put you on a proton pump inhibitor to decrease your stomach acid, which is the worst thing you can do because now you're going to have even lower stomach acid. So the bacteria is going to want to grow there even more so. So that's the wrong approach. Actually taking supplements, but you need to work with somebody, right? So your part, the working with us or someone else, you will probably take, you might want to be taking a little bit more of the betaine HCL supplements, but you need to treat the parasite so that you don't have the inflammation so that your stomach acid can return to normal also. But as we do get older, our stomach acid definitely de does decrease. Flukes, yick, yes. <laughs> you have seen so many and some of them are very small. So we're talking today about they're called like giant intestinal flukes. And they can be, I've passed ones that were at least five centimeters or six, it might have been seven centimeters. I was quite shocked the last time. That was the biggest time that I passed them. Right up there with tapeworms, just absolutely disgusting. And they look sort of like, like snails, sort of, yes. So cayenne can be helpful, and our students sometimes will use cayenne. But if you want to recover from chronic disease, cayenne is not enough by itself. The herbs are not enough by themselves. We have tried, and we would rather use herbs. So it's really what is your goal? Is your goal to be like better than normal, or is your goal just to try to do, wing it on your own and just hit, miss, and throw mud on the wall? And we have found that that doesn't work very well. But yes, cayenne, pepper, the, the, the parasites don't like them. They don't like heat. They don't like all kinds of things. A couple more questions and I'm, then I'm going to let you go. So you just finished a three-month treatment. Um, you feel a good change. And again, I hope that was the right one for you because it might help a little bit, but did it really help? These parasites are challenging to treat. Okay, I'm going to let you guys go. There's a lot more questions. Go ahead and type them in. We will answer your question. The images are from a microscope. No, they weren't. <clears throat> they were just, that's a tape measure, three inches long. Yeah, so pyrantal pomoate is available in a drugstore, but I don't want you to think that everybody has flukes. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that if you have digestive symptoms, if you have all kinds of symptoms, if you have any type of disease, autoimmune disease, you definitely have parasites. And then instead of trying to just wing it, it's really important to use systematic approach so that you can recover. There's so many reasons why this is important. For example, if you do have a tapeworm and you don't treat it well enough, then it's going to continue to lay eggs in you and you can self-infect yourself and the larval cysts can move into your central nervous system. They can move into different organs. They can cause a lot of neurological damage, neurocystocercosis. The tapeworm larval cysts in your brain are awful. So if you have a tapeworm for years, they can cause a lot of problems. If you have fluke infections for years, again, the immature forms are kind of like the worst. And even with round forms, round worms, the microfilaria, like the, the immature form, they get into the central nervous system and they cause, they cause a lot of havoc. And it's over time that they make their way into the central nervous system. So that's why 
it's very important to treat parasites when you have like gut symptoms, treat it well, treat it effectively so that you no longer have those symptoms. Maybe depending on your exposure to parasites, but they are coming in on our vegetables, our produce. If you're in the soil, if you like to work in your garden, um, if you're in water, if you're swimming and you accidentally drink water, you could easily infect yourself with certain parasites. So we don't have to be paranoid. We need to keep living. And I was, I was on a, really quickly I'll finish, I was on a website for a veterinarian, veterinarian and they were saying, like, you need to keep your dog indoors and make sure that they're not eating rodents. And it's like, oh, my gosh, let your dog be a dog. Let your dog sniff. Let your dog live. They can't live in a bubble, right? And we can't live in a bubble either. But when we have chronic disease, if we don't treat the cause, we end up not living our life, right? And, and life is so precious. So with that, I'm going to let you guys go. I really hope that you have found that you'll find these pictures helpful. Um, if you ever want, you can send me some, uh, if you want to send me some pictures, that would be lovely. I have hundreds and hundreds of pictures and that's how we've learned so much. So with that, I'm going to let you guys go. If you're at a place where you're like, oh my gosh, Pam, that was pretty disgusting, but I'm really concerned that that's why I'm not feeling well. Watch my masterclass training and that way you are going to be able to see if you are dealing with parasites. You're going to see the plan, the step-by-step -step plan that we use to recover. You're going to see so many case studies of people. It's been life-changing for them. And if you need support, reach out to us. You can be a wellness champion. We have people joining every week from all over the world. And yes, we can help you access the help that you need. By the grace of God, we are doing this work. Absolutely. And otherwise, please like and share this video. We will be making our blog. It's on livediseasefree.com. It'll be ready by Friday sometime. And uh, make sure to go to our website. I have so many amazing blogs recently that are so helpful. And I put my notes there so you can read it. There's links. And then you'll see the pictures. And there will be an edited version of the video. It'll be cut down a little bit so that it's shorter. But please share this. If you believe in this, if you've been a wellness champion, please help me to get the word out. I just have this in my spirit that it's time. It's time for change. And by the grace of God, change will come and this will go mainstream and the doctors will treat people early when they're first diagnosed so they don't have to suffer, so they don't have to end up with disability. That is my hope and that is my prayer. So with that, I hope you have a wonderful week. Take care. Bye-bye for now.